All right, hey everybody, I'm Jason Shadrick, and this is Chasing Frets. Welcome back for another week. I'm joined here with Andy Ellis. Hello, everyone. And uh, we have such a special guest this week. I know we say that a lot, but, you know, hey, we get to hang out with a bunch of cool guitar players week after week after week. And this week we have John Pizzarelli, um, who I've been listening to for years and years and years. Great jazz guitar player, great singer. And uh, and one of the modern purveyors of like the George Van Epps style of seven string. And I think for many people, when they hear this episode, they will come away with a new understanding of the seven string guitar. Yes. And uh, so John, John's father, Bucky Pizzarelli, was a famous uh, session guitar player in, in the sixties, growing up, and and sadly passed away a few months ago. And you really hear throughout these episodes how obviously he was an influence because, you know, your dad plays guitar and you play with him a lot. That's all good. But you really hear kind of the deep uh, love and appreciation he has for his John has for his father's playing and what that playing, how that playing has influenced him and what he's doing to kind of carry on the, the tradition. So uh, so today's episode, we're going to really break down kind of his lineage with the seven string guitar. And he uses a low A, as we talked about. So it's basically a standard six-string guitar with a low A. And, and kind of his journey through discovering that. And even uh, and the whole time, John has a guitar in his hands. And he really breaks down uh, in pretty easy-to-understand terms how to, how to move, if you want to move from the six-string to the seven-string. And, and like you say in the, in the uh, show today, Andy, you had a dream, a premonition, uh, a revelation that even maybe made you convert out of you. So uh, so join us this week with John Pizzarelli. I'm Dweezil Zappa. On my own musical journey, I've had two mentors. One of them was my dad, and the other was Edward Van Halen. The impact Edward Van Halen made on music is enormous, and I find it fascinating to learn how top guitarists were affected and influenced by his playing. Every episode in this series will reveal something different about Van Halen's music. I'll be taking you on a song-by-song discovery of the nuances in the music that literally change people's lives. Put on your shoes. It's time to start running. found exclusively at dweezilzappa.com, a reward music-powered artist site. So, John, welcome to Chasing Frets, man. How are you? Fantastic. <laughs> as well as can be expected under the conditions. Exactly, right? Yes, yes. Insane conditions, yes. I'm so looking forward to this this week for a long time because I've been a fan of your music for, for decades now. And the first episode today is I really, Andy and I really want to dive into kind of your history, your love, and your appreciation of the seven string. Now, banjo was your first instrument, correct? I played tenor banjo when I was six. Uh, my father's uncles were tenor banjo players. So, uh, and one of them actually taught in a place called Victor's House of Music in uh, Ridgewood. So I would go and take lessons from uh, Bobby Dominic was his name. And... Uh, I think Bobby died in July of 72. Uh, and then I went to his brother, who was more, uh, uh, he had a system. Like, you know, with Bobby, it was sort of like C chord three times. G chord. Okay, back to the C. Whereas Pete had a sheet, and he would have, it say, uh, you know, one, two, and strum three times. And then... And, and you'd end up playing yes, sir, that's my baby. It was like amazing. They, so it was, they were two completely different guys, and but two miraculous musicians. And they were the same guys who taught my father. So band mm. happened, and then 
Oh. Really, the, the story goes is that, so 72, Pete dies in, at, on Christ, Christmas Eve, and then I was sitting around the house going, uh, oh, I could, uh, oh, there's a book, and the book was an Elton John book, and it had a, uh, you know, the tablature in it, and I was going, well, it's good old country comfort in my bones, and I was, oh, so then I realized I switched to the six, and then uh, the seventh string comes along uh, like when I'm like 16 or 17, believe it or not, in a day camp that I was working in. When I was part of the music, <laughs> there was a thing called Hobby Hour. And at Hobby Hour, I was like the music guy with another guy. And the other guy, his name was Mike Taplinger, studied with Barry Galbraith. Mm. And so he was like, gee, and he would play tunes. And so I would start to accompany him. And my father would say, you got to play the seven with him. So he, I was just sort of cigarette holder. And I said... And I don't know how I figured it out, but my father, had, oh, the story, I'm sorry, it's getting longer and longer now. This is the place for it, no, John. This is it. the place for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let it rip. <laughs> the best uh, uh, exercise to learn the seven string guitar was the song Watch What Happens, because it's all the forms. So, the, you know, you have E flat here on a regular guitar, but now you have low E flat. So the form is this. So it was like, let someone, do, 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 do. Then there's F7. So it's just the same, you know, and, and that's do, 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 F minor. And then B flat, and watch what happens. Da. And it's so basically, that's the whole, you know, the tune. They go, da, 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 G minor, C7, F major. It's just those, it was one, two, three, four, four forms. And so you basically had the whole thing. One, six, two, five, da, da. It was all there. And so my thing was, I want to play with my father. I got to get in on, I got to get on the fun. And <laughs> I learned, started to learn George Barnes solos off of records and learn the, the, the things they were doing on Honeysuckle Rose. And I was sort of playing George's part and Bucky would accompany me. And then I had to accompany him. And he literally said one day, you know, when we went to a concert, don't play the six string tonight, play the other one. And I was like, what, excuse me? And it's like, yeah. And then cloud by fire. But it was sort of, it was so great to have this E flat, D flat, C, B, B flat. So it, it really was a, I mean, Bucky was the only guy in 1969 who took that George Van Epps seven string and wrote it into the sunset. You know, it was amazing. And I think we should mention for our listeners, uh, many of whom are rock guitarists and seven string in the rock world it often right. has a low B on it. And you're playing a low A. And John, I am not kidding. I had a dream <laughs> last night that I understood it all. You know how those dreams are? Sometimes you, you get your fretboard thing and all of a sudden it's like, bam. I was thinking about how you play with an A because, again, most rock players are used to the B string, you know, keeping the fourth interval structure all the way down to the seventh string. And I went, wait a second. Those forms that you were just talking about, I have an octave down A. So any chord form that I'm familiar with that has, particularly, let's just make it simple, has a root on the A string, on the five string uh, of a six string guitar. On the seven string, you just, same fret, you just hop over the E string and there you are and, and you're, you're making some, uh, hand signals <laughs> like, yeah, you got it, yeah. And so suddenly you've got this octave in the same fret. It's, you don't have the forms to do change. Anything. It's all right there. So and if you just play a small C7, that's what Bucky would always say first. He said, you go, play a C7. Now, just put the C on the low note. So if you break it down to a small C7, you move this finger back, C minor. You move this one forward, C major 7. Da, 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 da. Two, five. And, and then you have... And, and dominant nines and all of that good stuff. And, it, and it's so simple, but it, it, it's just about getting used to that seven string originally. And then you, for chord melody, it becomes a it's 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 a guess, you know, because all the keys work now. Well, I have this uh, solid body seven string that has not come out of its case in six years. And last night I had the epiphany, you know, because I had it tuned down to B and I've embraced baritone guitar six string so I'm, I'm in the b realm but just on a six string and all of a sudden thanks to you and doing some homework on this <laughs> podcast i went 
oh, that Dan Electro is coming out. Yeah, it is now coming out. I get it. Fantastic. <laughs> We've got one conversion already. Do I hear two? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm converted. Yeah. So, uh, so when you're 16, 17, and you decide to take the jump, or maybe Bucky pushed you, more like sounded like, uh, in the seven string. How did that kind of connect with the music you were hearing and were just liking to like like to listen to as a teenage kid, teenage guitar player? Yeah, I mean, at that time. From the time I was 16 to even 30, I was still writing pop songs and I was getting my little four track uh, cassette deck and I had my Stratocaster and I had a Fender Flame and uh, I had a Mesa Boogie amplifier. I still have the, the, the <laughs> SOB amp, which is the greatest. And uh, I would write these pop tunes and I even had a group that would play. Uh, we played Allman Brothers and... Uh, the Beatle cover tunes, like, you know, Money and, uh, you know, all those things. And we would go and play, and we still had certain nights when we would play that stuff, and then I would work with my father and play the play the seven string, and my father said, you're the only guy who plays jazz to support his rock and roll habit. <laughs> that's funny. That's actually, <laughs> that's really funny. And I did all my ear training in college. My ear training in college was listening to Steely Dan records. So, you know, I was try all of a sudden going. And I was finding all these crazy voicings that I was hearing on those records and then oh, and started to write songs like that. But it was I, everything was in play at that time. It's just that, uh, you know, being a tremendously good songwriter uh, in the 80s. Uh, led to my father introducing me in, well, 1980 was the turning point because he said, well, why don't you listen to the Nat King Cole trio? Because I was looking for material that would be something that would relate to me. And so that was the thing, because it had all of the ingredients of uh, what I liked about the people, that, about James, you know, that I liked about James Taylor and Jackson Brown and, mm -hmm. you know, the songwriters that I really dug and the Beatles and Paul McCartney and, uh, uh, but here was songs that I could sing straight up fly, right? Route 66, Frem Fram sauce. It wasn't night and day. You are the one, you know, that wasn't me at 20, right. but I could sing up and fly, right? It had, these were rhythm tunes. And so that just opened the whole world. I could have fun. I found the way to have fun playing jazz that was a connection to me and, and the guitar. And then listening to Oscar Moore and going, oh, this is the guitar player. He's a rhythm guitar player. He's a single note player. And he's got, and they got the little shout things with, that they would do together. And all of that stuff made it as, it, it, that was like, oh, I found what I wanted that was going to make me happy uh, playing music, uh -huh. especially since I was going to be playing with this phenomenal jazz guitar player for the next 10 years. Yeah. I had material. <laughs> It really made it fun and it really became something that we had a lot of fun doing, you know. Did you ever experiment with different variations of seven string tunings or were you always just straight and narrow on the low A? Yeah, I, I actually, no, I always, same thing with the low A. Uh, I have, was the guy, uh, Marco Pereira, I met in uh, Rio, who was a great seven string guitar player who plays with, uh, it, as I would say, Hamilton de Holanda, but it's like Hamilton de Holanda who's a, a, a mandolin player and he would they you know they would like have things then when they would tune this to a different note to have that so it would be a different kind of they can tune it to a c or a b whatever would you know it would ring but i always just kept it the way it was uh because i you know i'm i, I don't have i'm not magellan <laughs> on the guitar i'm sort of i stay on the land <laughs> Yeah, but here's something I'd like to address your right hand technique for a second because I was thinking about this. I don't, off the top of my head, I can't think of too many guitarists who've developed the legit classical four finger style, finger style, which you use so well for bossa nova and flat pick so it's not only single note lines but also the crisp chunk 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 the freddie green stuff mm -hmm. and people tend to specialize you got george benson you know monster flat picker you got tommy emmanuel 
monster fingerstyle player. Charlie Bird played with a fingerstyle. Uh, you know what? Where did these two things come to, to to integrate in in your technique? Did you get the flat pick plectrum first, and then bring in the fingerstyle, or vice versa, or were they just in tandem all the time? Uh, I think they be they were sort of. There was the idea of trying to go playing this James Taylor stuff and finger picking a little bit. My father made a, a record called Bucky's Bunch in the seven, like seventy six, so he was going. And actually, on one of his records, he played on uh, Geneseans at seventeen, and the only thing he plays on it is. had a hole in the song and Brooks Arthur said Bucky can you fill that and he played that lick twice so I remember saying tell me the lick you know so there was this idea of the bossa nova we had these classical guitars in the house but the other thing was when you played with Bucky if I'm talking too fast I don't even have coffee yet but, but if, <laughs> New York if, uh, the thing about playing with Bucky was you know if I was playing Honeysuckle Rose and I'd have the pick in here so when it, if he said it's your turn to blow, I had a, I grabbed the pick, you know, and, and so they became tandem because out of uh, terror, you know, I just had to like Bucky'd say take it, and I oh I'd have to get the pick out and start to do. It. Explain for our our radio audience here. Uh, you just showed the the pick. You know, you flashed your hand to our zoom camera. It is under your middle finger between the first and third joints, right? And you're just... So it, it, you can still play the... You can still play all those chords. And then what I usually have to do is I have to lick my uh, thumb and first finger so that I... I as they get to... Uh, they would, I would drop the pick otherwise. So sometimes there's a video of me playing I Got Rhythm where they say, and there's where John takes the pick out of his mouth. Which is no, it's, it's fretboard journal. I looked at it this morning, and I thought you took yeah. it out of your mouth. I I know the video. <laughs> so that's where I I grab it because uh, it, it's easier to it, it sort of provides a little something to make it so I can hold on to it. So, a little glue, yeah. natural glue, a little hide glue. <laughs> that, that whole thing between the finger picking and the and the and the flat picking was all part of. Uh, playing with Bucky, and because uh, I asked him what he had to do to play with George Barnes, and sometimes he'd have to go, he'd have to play Honeysuckle Rose, and then so he'd have that pick, or he had to play a, he had to play the melody on it. So if he had to start and then play, a, a, you know, and so George would be blowing, but Bucky had to switch back to his fingers. So. I asked him once. He said, "I keep it. In, you know, I would hide it as best I could in here, or sometimes maybe even on your on his knee." So that was right. the that was it. Just the, the two always that were in tandem. Out of that's you know you had to make figure it out somehow. <laughs> I want to yeah. kind of convert a little bit and talk about your rhythm playing, and it's obviously coming from a, Fr a Freddie Green school, but it's but in your trio you have piano, which is a, a denser harmonic instrument than the guitar. And you have a bass, uh, upright bass, which, with the addition of your low A string, you could possibly step on both toes at the same time. So mm -hmm. when it comes to your rhythm playing, how do you, within the confines of your trio, how do you kind of navigate that? Well, I switched guitars on the on the uh, on the Zoom to, to because I can skip over it on the on the seven string. I don't. I stay away from the bass notes. Even uh, I show I was doing I did a record once with Ray Brown called Some of My Best Guitars Some of My Best Friends Are Guitarists and I was playing my father's tangerine arrangement uh, and and when I did he'd go lay off my notes so uh, I, I you know that was I've always been conscious of not playing any of those bass notes in the thing and. The piano is going to play all the chords. The bass note, bass player is going to play the bass. I'm the musical hi hat. So if we're playing the blues in B flat, and you hear the chords. <laughs> Guitar might be out of tune. Sorry. So instead of having to play all this, I only have to play the seventh or the third. So I'd go. So 
I'm just playing that, and it, and that's how that works. It just you lay on that, and I can do that on the seventh string and stay out of everybody's way. And then the only thing that we end up doing sometimes is we may, we may go uh, together, you know. Da, 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 da. And but those will all be worked out with the piano player. So, uh, and those come from it, like the old school big band hits that the horn section would be doing. Yeah, yeah and that's all, I can hear it when you yeah. play it that way. It just I, there are the right, horns, and that's right the whole there. idea is that the guitar becomes three different parts. You got the you have the rhythm down here, and you have on the top four you, you have the horn section, and sometimes in the middle, my father would call it the cello section. You know, so uh, it's an interesting, and and just it's also the advantage of all of that is working with one of the great rhythm guitar players <laughs> for ten years, and then going, yeah. no, that's it, yes, oh, you know, pointing out all the things that are right, you know, so you know that maybe this is Eddie Lang, but this is Freddie Green. So those, it's a, it's. You start to, because you you end up in rooms with really great guitar players, you you get to learn those things. That was the the big advantage was going to the University of Bucky Pizzarelli for ten years on the road. You know, so mm. there you go. <laughs> Did that answer the question after I rambled on for so long? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I want to wrap up this episode with is kind of uh, one thing I've I've noticed is pretty fiery in your playing are your chord solos, and uh, and I do hear influences from Wes Montgomery in those when it comes to that. But can you kind of uh, break down what you're thinking as you as you're piling through, blazing through all these chord solos on the top four strings? Yeah, I think you know that's the other part where the where the banjo playing at a young age came in because it's you know you know there because that's the same with the you know I, knowing and it's it's a terrible thing to say but it's you know it's the other part of sitting there and going behind Bucky Pizzarelli while he's going. So I got to see all those formations coming after me. And I think that the right hand being having played banjo at an early age uh, really paid off in uh, developing, you know, getting that and being able to skip over strings and also just to concentrate on the strings you want to hear, you know, that kind of thing. So. So you, it's it's all that kind of things that Bucky showed me. That you know the way that walking the chords up, you know, from a, uh, from F, G minor, A minor, B flat, and then you have, and the guitar is terribly out of tune. But um, those kinds of things, you know, even G minor. just the way that walk those little chords are on the top four strings were all things that were in Bucky's books that I got to see him do firsthand all the time. And that made a big difference in uh, how I was going to develop what I was going to do as I got, I think that was the best part as I got to see how we did it. And when you talk about Wes Montgomery, I think Bucky got to be in the studio with him, had the records were in the house. And I think Django Reinhardt and George Barnes, mm -hmm. Uh, and George Van Epps would be the guys who, when you, they all did that kind of thing, you know, the way that Wes was, you know, he would play those little solos and uh, start with maybe single note, then go to octaves, and then go to a chord solo. And, I, and I'd see Bucky do that all the time. It'd be something like it. He'd be playing the thing, and then he'd start going... Uh, You know, he, there was ways that he started to set those things up. So uh, just from those three, four guitar players, I think was a big uh, influence on him and then on me also. I think, too, we, we should say just just before we end, for the listeners who are not hip to tenor banjo, who are thinking banjo, five-string banjo, bluegrass banjo, the tenor banjo, 
four string, correct me if I'm wrong, played with the plectrum and was one of the early jazz instruments and very much the the chunk rhythm that you've been describing. Yeah, and my, actually the reason my uh, when my father went for his lessons with his uncles who were playing tenor banjo in that style, chords, chord melody, yep. tenor banjo, uh, they said, you know, the guitar is coming in now. You know, so he, my father was born in 26, so by the time... It's 1936. The guitar is becoming the lead rhythm instrument. It's taking over from the banjo. And they said, you don't need to know the banjo. We're going to get you on the guitar, get you going on that. Yeah. So that was exactly the, the point that the banjo had that big drum head on it, made it loud enough to be heard. And the, the original guitars were a little bigger than the one I'm holding. They were like 18 inches, you know, and they were made to be to cut through the band. So right. that's a very good point. I got to say, I uh, my first introduction to your father's style was I was ordering, I ordered uh, one of your CDs from Mel Bay back when I was in college and a couple other books, and they accidentally sent me one of Bucky's books. Oh, wow. Completely accidentally. And I'm like, oh, what's this? And I start opening it up, and I'm looking at the tab because I couldn't read music that well. I was like, there's an extra line here. What's going on? <laughs> you know? And, and that's what kind of got me into, especially because I could play those, I could try to figure out and read those chord solos without having a seven string guitar, you know, since they're on the top four strings. Right. And you could find the C minor, you know. <laughs> You don't need to have that yep. and you could once you you added that you had a whole different sound so but it, right that's the point there was no change in the forms they all still worked that's great well john we're so excited to have you this week uh he's going to join us here for the rest of the week here on chasing frets so we'll be back on wednesday with more from john pizzarelli and i promise to tune up by then mm-hmm.